comfortably zoned with the zigzag man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. I am back. You are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco in the northern part of the state. And um, it's down by the lagoon at the 420 studio. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be anywhere in my 70th year, if you start to think about it. This has been a rough, rough three or four months for celebrities, and thank God I'm not one. Um, we just lost Prince, and um, it's getting out of hand. So um, I'm going to count my blessings that um, we're still here. Um, my guest is from Connecticut. He is my godfather on this um, comfortably zoned radio network. He's been on two or three, four or five times maybe over the years. Tony D'Angelo from Connecticut. How are you, sir? I'm fine and uh, happy to be your uh, your godfather. I, uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've always believed as. Phil Ragazzino would say in Ripawam High School in Stanford, Connecticut, as some people will be listening to that and will know exactly who I mean and what I mean, the cream always rises, and Zig, you're the cream, and uh, it is time for you to rise. Ah, uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, like I say, Tony, your compliments make me glow, and uh, you're an old-time radio guy, and podcast is a new, um, a new venue. How did you get into um, internet radio, internet shows, when you started uh, way back in Connecticut? Well, I mean, uh, you, you know, it's funny. Uh, like, like I always say, it's funny. When I was in high school, and it's, it, it is funny the way things never really seem to change, even though they seem to be changing all the time. I was maybe a junior and senior in high school. I was listening to well, then it was WNBC Radio out of New York, 66. It's now known as Fan Radio. It's a, a sports station. And back then it was kind of a mixed um, music and talk format. This is when few people had FM radios in their cars. They may have had them in their home, possibly, uh, you know, depending. Not everybody had an FM radio. Um, and... It was uh, so if you were in the car or, you know, if you were getting ready for school or something, it was usually an AM radio. And I became very attached to the people that were broadcasting at that time. It was a, a very young Don Imus when he was funny, I think, before he uh, lost a few of his marbles. And uh, it was uh, Ted Brown, and uh, it was an, an older Murray the K at that point who really had kind of lost his fastball. But, you know, he still had the... Uh, he still had the bumps and the inflections, and I thought, well, I either want to go into radio or I want to go to business school and see what happens from there. And, uh, you know, Zig, I, I, if, if you want to talk about the beginning, which I think was really kind of dormant for so many years until Bob Lazari asked me eight years ago if I would help him with the uh, the television broadcast of the sports show, you know, um, up, up here in the northeastern Connecticut. I, I kind of forgot where I left it, and I, I still kind of put myself in that thing of uh, what do you want to be doing, uh, Tony? Do you want to be doing you know what you do uh, on a daily basis, or do you want to be doing broadcasting? And uh, but um, having fun doing what I do, and it's um, it, it's really something well, because you get to do both. You, you get to have a significant day job and. Um, can't really tell which is your day job if you stop to think about it both are equally important in your life and you get to balance the two uh, and some days i don't and it drives me crazy but thank you for saying that <laughs> yeah well um anytime you get to use both sides of your brain i think that's a good that's a good thing um but uh, yeah the, the old-time radio it, person it is no, you first. Uh, I'm did sorry. Did you listen to a lot of sports on the radio when you grew up? Well, you know, it's um, 
the, the big thing back then was um, if you turned on the Yankee broadcast, and this is like you know late 1960s, 1970s, you got Frank Messer, who was a you know terrific baseball broadcaster. Um, you know, kind of uh, history really doesn't give him uh, the credit that it might give some of the others, but just a very good, solid baseball man. Um, Phil Rizzuto, Jerry Coleman. Um, I'm a little bit, even though I remember Mel, you know, Mel came back in the 70s and started doing things, and then he started, uh, you know, showing up in the 80s. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, this week in baseball, Mel was legendary with that. You had that on one dial. Um, the Mets, you had uh, Lindsey, um, Bob, and Ralph. And you know, they were Bob terrific. Murphy, Ralph Kiner. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, in the winter, uh, WNBC uh, did uh, – Nick, Nick and Ranger games, and uh, there was a remarkable young man at that time by the name of Marv Albert who was able to do hockey games and basketball games with equal ease, which is not easy. And he would um, he would call uh, every single game. He was out of the garden, and, uh, you know, he would sometimes call uh, a basketball game in the afternoon and a hockey game at night, and uh, he became uh, kind of a – uh, sort of a legend to us listening to him, um, and he was, uh, you know, and he was flawless doing it. Uh, and uh, you know, so there was a lot of sports, you know, at, at that time on the radio. It wasn't like quote unquote sports radio. Um, that really did not come about, I'd say, until perhaps I'm going to say when WABC, you know, dear beloved and. The departed WABC 77 Music Radio um, left the, the music uh, band in about I'd say it might have been 1982 or 1983. It was one of those years. It probably was 1982, and went to talk. It was a, a, Whoa! What happened? Where'd that come from? What the heck happened there, Tony? Well, I'll tell you. I mean, that, that, that that's like ringing a bell in front of a punch dunk fighter when you play that stuff. It's like I, I don't I, know. I just, the, it, that was something from the Internet. I did nothing. I pushed nothing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, what the heck happened? You know, I've got an assistant who works on my technologies called Meshuggah Boychik, and um, <laughs> he doesn't always do things right, but um, that's some good sound. That's um, um, that was a great well, station, and that all left us. And, and then uh, it went to a talk show format. But if you talk about you know sports talk radio, there's a, a gentleman um, who's lost to history, um, named Art Rust, who would introduce himself as Arthur George Rust Jr., affectionately the sportscaster with the four names. Um, very um, art, articulate, um, very precise, intelligent man. And, wrote a um, book, as a matter of fact. He wrote, yeah, and uh, highly critical of of things. He he didn't hold back. He, uh, you know, being a black man, he uh, was firmly convinced of several things that uh, all the pressures on Jackie Robinson killed him. Um, he also was at this time was espousing a uh, what was no, a radical belief. Um, even though I, as I look at it, I think it's purely possible that Babe Ruth was uh, was half black, and uh, why you never heard of Babe Ruth's mother, uh, be, and, and why his father hated him because he was the product of uh, Babe's father and uh, a black prostitute, you know, down on the wharf in Baltimore. Uh, you know, who's to say? I mean, history gives it no credence whatsoever. But I know the few color movies that exist of the Babe. He is a very dark man. Um, and, and, and that was something they always, you know, jabbed him with when he was playing, you know, and uh, call, call him all sorts of things that aren't fit for a family radio program. And, uh, you know, Art had his uh, very uh, – uh, he was very opinionated, not in, a, in an offensive, boorish way like Mike Francesa might be from time to time. But yet, you know, he would intelligently dispute things. And uh, I, I was a caller on his show for a while – 
and, and I was thinking about this last night. Art had uh, Art didn't have the best reputation, shall we say? He used to like right. to borrow twenty dollars and not pay people back. Oh, <laughs> and he did this repeatedly. Heard that? So uh, one I time I never would have had twenty dollars to lend him, so that would have been. <laughs> I, I, I was in similar circumstances, but I would be calling in as Tony from Pound Ridge. Long story, Pound Ridge is a, a, a wealthy, leafy suburb in Westchester County in New York. Um, I, I believe uh, Ralph Branca either lived there or might have lived there at one time. Uh, and I was staying in a very large house there when um, my mother had I, – I had no money. I was just getting out of school. My mother had sold her house in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, and I was in, and I was in this house primarily by myself. It was a mansion house. It was amazing. This is probably a period of five or six months. And at one point, Art Russ, thinking that I was probably somebody that owned property in Pound Ridge, I could barely pay the rent, said, uh, "I'm going to give you to my producer, who will copy down your name and address and telephone number." And I thought I have arrived. I've made the impression on a uh, uh, a you know New York sports legend. And right. thankfully, I gave the information, uh, and, and I never heard from him. And essentially, what he was doing was looking for other people he could borrow twenty dollars from and not pay uh. them back. <laughs> and he figured I'm in Pound Ridge, so I'm wealthy, you know. So uh, it's He's networking. Uh, but, He's networking. So, yeah, he he did that very well. And yeah. always, it, it was never Yankee Stadium. You know, he's just like, I'm never going to, he, he would never say I'm going to Yankee Stadium. I'm going to the big ball orchard in the South Bronx. And he would always go to the Yankee um, organist, Eddie Layton, who was there forever, and I loved Eddie. Um, and, and, like, you know, say, uh, to, and give him a list of songs, you know, Mood Indigo, um, uh, you know, re- really kind of a sentimental you. <laughs> and you'd often wonder why Eddie was playing this stuff. Art was telling him to play it. Uh, uh, that's beautiful. But anyway, I'm kind of off the track here, but I thought that was an interesting story. Did you, were you like me, did you go to bed with the transistor radio in your ear? In the oh, I sure did. Okay. Living on top of a big hill in Stanford, Connecticut, which I had calculated through my very, um, how could I put it, unofficial tally of anything. You're talking about somebody who barely got through earth science. I, I, I think it was, or is, the second highest elevation in Stanford, Um I was able at night to pull in all kinds of broadcasts. So I'd be listening to um, WBAL. I'd be listening to the Philly games with Bai Sam. Um, I would be listening to um, Harry Carey in Chicago because it was back then, you know, these 50,000 clear channel stations were just given the opportunity to roam and roam and roam. There's, There's a very, you mentioned WABC. Right. There, was, there is a particular story which you can read on the music radio website that describes how that WABC signal re- reverberated all the way as far as Colorado, clearly. And it, it, it's beyond my technical grasp, but I think I know what they're getting, how the waves would you know, ricochet off the atmosphere and things like that. So there was a lot of great well, radio. I'd get KMOX from St. Louis, but clear as a bell in the middle yeah. of the night. And, yeah, um, Jack Buck, sure. Yeah, not only Jack Buck, but um, but basketball. I was a big St. Louis Hawks apologist ah. mm-hmm. uh, back when they had Pettit and Hagen, and um, the ABA was about to fold, and I had a play. I had um, a camp counselor by the name of Barney Cable, and he came from Bradley, and he was playing in the NBA, and he was playing with the Hawks, and it was just as the NBA, as the ABA was folding, and the Hawks picked up three guys, uh, geez, two guards who, uh, my God, they escaped my name, I think one of them might have been John Barnhill, but they picked up Gene Tormolin and Billy Bridges and added to Pettit Luskatov and those guys. They were terrific. And I got to hear the radio from my mother's kitchen in the middle of the night. I got to hear St. Louis Hawks basketball. Radio was incredible. I mean, not just um, local, but I was realizing you can get radio from all over. 
but I got one quick radio story to tell you. I'm stationed in California in the Air Force. They send me to San Francisco, close to San Francisco, Travis Air Force Base. And I get out here, and I knew I'd be missing New York radio, New York sports. So I'm tuning with the dial, and it says um, W99 Pittsburgh. I'm thinking, whoa, I'm in California. I get Pittsburgh on this little radio. Let me go to the BX where they sell you stuff and get a big radio. I'll be able to get New York from Pittsburgh. But well, turns out I was getting Pittsburgh, California, which was about 30 miles <laughs> from where I w- was. I put $20 that I didn't have into a big old radio, and um, I couldn't get Pittsburgh, California again on that radio, let alone Pittsburgh, New York, let alone New York, New York. But um, so it's, well, you know, uh, radio, it, it makes an impression on you. You know, I um, I had a friend. He's my friend to this day, and he uh, his mother had one of these old Cadillacs with a signal seeking radio, and you know, back when that was you know a very rare thing. And we would be out like on rainy nights, and this would be like in Stanford, Connecticut, or Greenwich, Connecticut, and you'd hit that bar and. It would land right on the Big Eight out of Detroit, CKLW, which is the best Motown station ever. It was absolutely unbelievable. They played everything. Right, and th- this is what early '66, '65. Oh, I- I'd say this would probably be early '70s. This would be about 1972. So it was Temptations, okay. Top Supremes, Spinners. Gotcha, gotcha, Drifters. Yeah. Isley yeah. Brothers. Good music. Good music. Let me, um, I'm thinking about some of the things we talked about. You were talking about Marv Albert. And yes. In, uh, um, after you and I talk, there's a couple of segments that we're going to tack this on to. One of them is an interview I did with the fella that made a movie on the life of Marty Glickman. And um, Marty Glickman was, if you remember correctly, he was the track star that made the Olympics. The Jewish track star in the 1936 Olympics. Olympics. Right, 1936. They didn't want to embarrass Hitler. They didn't give him a chance to run. Um, The whole thing, he comes back to New York, a a well-educated, gentleman who wasn't embittered by his experience and became an incredible announcer in New York. And the reason I mention him now in context of this, he was basically Marv Albert's guru. And yes. um, Marv credits him both in, um, in the film and over the years in interviews with being extremely important in his life. And Marty Glickman was a terrific announcer. When I was a kid, the Giants, the New York football Giants, had Marty Glickman as an announcer and a guy by the name of Al DeRogatis as the... Um, he was the color man. As the color He man. was probably the first. It, the, absolutely. And they he put... They put together the, the dynamics of sharing the the, um, the microphone, share, you know, two guys doing it, and that was Marv Albert. He was a, an incredible guy, and they bring people in to um, to learn from him. Announcers from all over all over the country, mm-hmm. and um, so the radio was basically sports radio was Marty Glickman. He did the uh, the Knicks for a long time. Jim Palmer did the Knicks, I remember. But um, um, he did the Rangers. If you ever try to do hockey on the radio, hockey, uh, hockey announcing, you really have to be good to do hockey. We had yes, great announcers in New York. Um, you mentioned Murray Decay in the swinging soiree with a blast from the past. Um, Murray Decay still, I, I'm listening to Cyrus. This is about a year, year and a half ago. I don't know if he's still doing it, 
but there's an oldie station that I know you're not too happy with on Cyrus, um, because we've talked about this before. Elaborate on oldie music today and how that... um, Well, you know, and and I'm not a subscriber to satellite radio. I've been offered many times. Of course, you go out and you buy these cars today, and uh, the the last two we've got, which were uh, from... Toyota, the um, you know the the the, the quote unquote certified used cars, which is what uh, you know t- typically what I look for, and they have a satellite radio thing, and they keep giving you these offers. And I like if I rent a car, you know, I'll occasionally put it on. And there's a few people from the past, you know, Pat St. John or Bruce Morrow, um, you know, who are still very good, you know, still doing a very good product. Um, so many uh, of, of the DJs, you know, of, of that era, you know, have uh, they've gone on in years, or we've lost them. But uh, said all that to say this: my general, you know, path through the uh, the car dial or the radio dial, if you will, um, I'll, I'll occasionally punch up something to see if there's some music I can listen to on FM and the stations that are whatever you want to call them, commercially supported FM stations. Uh, you, you know, they they are so pathetic. It's just they don't know what they're playing. Um, the, the DJs are really a bunch of twenty-something pencil neck geeks. If I could sound like Freddie Blassie, um, they they have no understanding of the history that um, you're not supposed to play the short version of Beginnings. You're not supposed to play the short version of Light My Fire, um, you know, or Stairway to Heaven or something like that. And then they flip over to 15 or 20 minutes of all these inane commercials that are written, you know, that, that, that are voiced over by 17-year-old girls. It's like I'm saying this is this is terrible for crying out loud. The um, you, you know, and I'm not meaning really to disparage the people, even though I understand I just did. But um, the whole art of radio presentation. Um, if you go back and you listen to a, a very good thing, which I listen to and I have the opportunity, is a, which uh, you know I've shared with you, is um, an endeavor out of Terrytown, New York, known as Rewound Radio, and they play um, 60, 50, 60s, 70s music. And on Saturdays, they'll go to some classic original broadcast of a DJ broadcasting somewhere, usually in the 60s or 70s, and all the you know the, the the talk ups to songs, the inflections, the timing, uh, the uh, you know playing the jingles in and out. That's all lost, and no one is paying any attention to it. And that's really the whole flow of whatever you want to call it, top forty or oldies, because it sets the stage. Today you just get some you know really a goofy kid that doesn't know any better just reading song titles they play the wrong version of the song and then they're off to a commercial and this is all these radio i'm like please they will call me people will call me so you want to advertise my radio station it's like no I, i'd be embarrassed for crying out loud i don't want to do it and, and it's just i it, it just bothers me that when an art form you know all the great people that i listen to you know you, you're it's, it's just if if you don't remember it uh it's uh <laughs> Nobody really understands it. Like I keep saying, um, people will say to me, who is your favorite WABC disc jockey? Most people will say Bruce Morrow, who's still active. And that's, yeah, that, 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 that's Bruce. a good thing. Yeah, Cousin Brucey. And, and, and Cousin Brucey was really a staple. If you're doing your homework at night, you know, you listen to Cousin Brucey, who I think he was on like from 7 to 10 or something. And then on Saturdays, he did homework? the other. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I still do that. I still have like some low noise on when I'm working, uh, even to huh. this day. But um, the, um, you know, and, and and that's great. But my favorite guy who was in the '70s, who kind of came along a little bit after the uh, the party, if you will, on AM radio, but was there for a few years, was George Michael. And, you know, George went from there, and he started to do sports broadcasting almost exclusively. But George was George got me through a lot of nights in the 70s. He really was the best talk-up DJ I have ever heard as far as timing an announcement right before the beginning of a song, and he was perfect. And, I mean, the, the one or two times in all the years he was off, you knew it. That's how good he was. And he, and he had the perfect voice of generating that excitement and, and really making that connection. And 
That is such a lost art today. It drives me crazy, Zig. It really does. Yeah, that um, that's that is an art. People don't realize that the timing of it coming in after the break. Um, it, it really is, and it's a finely tuned game between the on-air personality and the technical producer. Yes, they have they have to work together in tandem, and. That's another thing. The producers in this world don't get enough credit for putting it all together. And that's always the way it is. That when somebody signs off, they should always sign off and credit the people in the booth. With oh, them. sure. Um, and that, that people have gotten away from that in the past. And, um, you know, it's, it comes down to teamwork. And, um, well, what's, you anyway, know, what's really we, fun, I, I'm sorry, and I interrupted. No, I just want to – I interrupted you. Oh, no, I, and, and, you know, it's like for all the years I, I say to myself, I've listened to Dan Ingram on WABC who was, you know, uh, on in the afternoon uh, when you left school, and he would always um, – the, the song is um, Billy May, Tri-Fi Drums, and he would run the last 30 seconds of it as he was getting out and, and timed it so perfectly. I started doing that on my Tuesday night show because we do nonprofit announcements, and I, I have my um, my young producer Mike Dubois run that for me. And uh, just a couple of times I've been able to do it like he did, but he he would do it like you know um, just flawlessly, and I would think this is easy. No, it isn't. Go try it. <laughs> right, right. Well, let's go back one second. You mentioned sure. Art Rust, and it almost sounds like we were. F- we were referring to him as the first person in New York to do sports radio. Sports radio, but yes. He wasn't. There was a fellow by the name of Bill Mazur. I no, I thought of Bill Mazur. Yeah, the amazing Bill Mazur. Yeah, and he preceded Art Rust in this thing when I was a kid. I'm about 10 years older than you, so there are certain advantages and yes. disadvantages to aging. One of the advantages is that I remember radio almost before there was TV. Not just almost, literally before we had a TV. It was, um, we got ours like in 52. Radio kept me going early on in the background. When I was four or five years old, they had shows, one of one, one of which was written by one of my mother's cousins, a fellow by the name of Stanley Niss, and the show was called Racket Squad. And oh, I love Racket Squad. Whole, you remember that show? That well, Racket if, if Squad. you were if you were a kid of my generation, the, the Sundays on WPIX in New York, starting at about ten thirty, were uh, Racket Squad, M Squad, Code Three, and the Yankee Game. That was that was Sunday well, in New I, York. I didn't know that. See, I'm learning. I, get I watch Racket Squad today. now. I, I, I go to the Internet, and I put it on my monitor. I love that show. Uh, I'm going to have to check that out and see if they credit Stanley Niss, my mother's cousin, who ah. also uh, produced a movie called Pendulum. Um, very few people remember that. And I can't remember the actor's name. Great character actor. Um Square face guy in Pendulum. Don't remember that one, but anything to do with name dropping in my family was great. You know, oh, Stanley Miss is on Racket Squad. They'd scream out the window. Um, it was, it was great. And but all kinds of shows. Um, the Lone Ranger, for instance, I remember that mm-hmm. vividly before te- television got your imagination. The whole thing was getting your imagination going and before you knew before you could see it on TV, you got to imagine it on the radio and that was terrific. And for me it was um it was people like Gene Shepard and it was Barry Gray and Barry Farber and um and Long John Nebel coming on in the middle of the night to keep me up all night learning stuff that had uh, nothing to do with school, but it had to do with life. My education basically 
was from these late night shows and the guests and the Isaac Asinoff who would sit uh, sit on a panel with um, uh, with Kurt Vonnegut and um, you get to learn about stuff and um, it was terrific. It, radio is is what it's at and um, and it's nice to get to talk to you being a guru. <laughs> I, 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 what, what did Ralph Cramden say? The glorious results of a misspent youth. <laughs> but, <laughs> here we are, um, Tony. It's a pleasure. It always as is. always. Um, I love it when you zoned. Thank you, and I I, I love to be zoned. And uh, my uh, my best greetings to everybody out now, Amita, and you know wherever you may be listening. Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, there was a sign off that Bill Mazur had that I completely forgot. <laughs> Whatever Bill used to say, I meant to say it and I forgot. Uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember his sign off, but I do remember, and I hate, I hate almost to tell this story, but it was before the, the seven second delay. So my friends would get together, and they'd call in Bill Mazur, and they'd be talking and just talk, and all of a sudden they'd come out with this horrible profanity. And <laughs> they had no way of, of cutting it off. And our big kick was that we'd get to say dirty words on the radio when we were kids. Um, well, well, you know, if you want to confess sin, I'll confess one. Uh, this goes back about maybe – close to 40 years ago, uh, Tommy Agee, God bless his soul, had a bar in Queens when he stopped playing baseball. Agee left baseball under very mysterious circumstances. He had that one year, I think, with St. Louis in 73, and then he was out of ball. And they said he was lazy and he didn't care. And, you know, um, Agee and Jones together were kind of like... Cleon uh, Jones. He owned that with Cleon Jones. It was Yeah, exactly. And, and they would just kind of like you know, sit on each other's tail feathers and they wouldn't hustle and all kinds of things like that. But anyway, one, one New Year's Eve, we were over at a, um, a restaurant in Stanford, which is still there, Polici's. I go there frequently. And if you're ever in Stanford, go to Polici's and tell them I sent you. And even if you forget to tell them I sent you, just go. It's that good. Okay. Um, so we, we came back uh, to the house, and this is just like a bunch of guys hanging around on New Year's Eve with no dates and don't want dates, and nobody will go out with us anyway. So we started to say, what what can we do that's really terrible? And then one of my friends gets the idea, well, let's call Tommy Agee at the Outfielders Lounge and wish him a happy New Year. Hey, great. So I had a friend that did a wonderful Absolutely flawless Bob Murphy imitation. You wouldn't think for a moment it wasn't Bob Murphy. <laughs> you know, so he called Tommy to the phone in his Bob Murphy voice and in great Bob Murphy flex saying, Tommy, I'd like to wish you a happy new year. I can't do it nearly as well. Right. <laughs> and Tommy's like, Oh gee, Bob, thanks a lot. <laughs> and somebody just started <laughs> bored. Yeah. All these I'm you're lazy, you quit baseball, you're a bum. Oh, it was horrible. And A.G. was like the nicest man, and I feel terrible to this guy, <laughs> even though I'm still yeah. laughing, so I'm guilty. But, you know, it's... Tommy uh, A.G. You know, made some catches. He and Svoboda oh, made some catches in that World Series in 69 that were <sighs> absolutely incredible. That was well, a, those are 25 a dream guys year that, for all Met fans. They thought, you know, they, nobody could tell them that they couldn't beat Baltimore, and what a team they beat. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, ironically, one of my uh, upcoming guests is a fellow by the name of Ron Gaspar from that team. Oh, I love Rod. Rod. Rod will tell it like it is. Yeah. So, he really um, will. He's very, my godfather he's very, set that up. Yeah, he, Rod is very hard on today's game, and justifiably so, and that's what makes him so much fun to talk to. Yeah, he'll, he'll tell yeah. you what's happening in a game and what players aren't doing, and you know, from from one that played. Absolutely, and um, yeah, I love looking back on those memories, and uh, as you say, it all revolves around radio in one way or the other. Yeah, well, so. you know, it's it's. And that's the thing I think that's lost today, Zig, you know, because radio is such a personal thing. It made such a personal connection to each one of us. And today I think it's just so mindless and brainless. They're just reading things 
and throwing things out there. And if you if you do AM, like yesterday, I had driven up to uh, Maine. My wife's Kathy's family's in Maine to pick her up and bring her back home. And if you hit the signal seek in the radio on AM, you're either going to get, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, Republican talk radio or sports radio with repetitive programs. There's no personal connection being made with any of this. It's just content. That's all it is. Yeah. You know, and it's and, not uh, And it's, it's advertising-driven. And that, oh, um, purely. purely. To the point where um, it's craziness. But... Um, we both long for those days of old. And this is why we do what we do. You know, it's just uh, if, if you can take something that you saw in the 60s or 70s and bring it back, like my producer, Mike, will say, that's amazing. I was like, no, that's as old as the hills for crying out loud. You, you, you know, but right. it, it's just fun to be able to do it. And I, uh, it was such a connection, you know, between, you know, you, you think as a kid growing up in the greater New York metropolitan area as you did, what a world you had. You had six TV channels and like four radio stations to listen to. The world couldn't be any better. And on Saturdays, you had the wide world of sports, which was really the whole drama in the 60s of politics and religion and sports all kind of hitting you. And that was Howard and Jim McKay and Bud Palmer and later Frank Gifford. And, you know, what a what a job they did. And Rune Arledge, Chet Fort. I mean, it's... Today, you know, and um, that gave that gave way to Monday Night Football. Chet yes. what was a Colombian guy played basketball yes, in Colombia, as a matter of fact, and uh, a genius. And he was able to harness Howard, which yeah. <laughs> for uh, for a few years. Let me tell you, before Howard became almost a caricature of himself towards the end, Howard was a genius. Howard had the the community of sports tuning in to see him and then the game. Yeah. He was the first one he was the first announcer to really capture it to that point. He had people buying bricks and throwing them at TVs. They had big uh, in department stores and what have you. People either loved him or hated him. And um, sometimes it, it carried over. You you didn't like him, but you had to listen to him, or you you liked him, but you had to disagree with him. Or he was um, he was an iconic character. And uh, well, the, I, yeah, and, and the NFL really does not understand the debt they owe to him because in every city where they would go. Howard would get out on that Monday afternoon. They'd have the special luncheon for the advertisers, and Howard would go for two hours and talk and tell stories. And then he would go to the booth, and he would, you know, impromptuly, I know that's not a word, do all those highlights. They would just run the movies, and Howard would just do the voiceover without notes um, saying, you know, what took place. And, and, And he was magnificent. Gifford. Uh, and I mean, I, I, you know, for all the, when we talked about Frank Gifford before and, you know, whatsoever good and whatsoever not so good, um, Gifford would not do any of that, neither would Meredith, neither would Simpson in those days. Gifford was back in the hotel room working with his 3 by 5 index cards because he was trying to remember, okay, the name, the school, the player, and some fact about him, and he would put them in formations on the bed, and that's how he'd practice. So Howard did a lot of promotion for the NFL, which really the NFL benefits through this day. Right. Um Someday they're going to make a movie on Howard. That's my guess. Yeah. Because um, I wonder who's going to play him, a Robert Mitchum kind of character or whatever. Um, thank you, Tony. This is terrific. As always, got, um, This is just the start. Um, we got Butch Haber coming on this show later on. He's going to talk about Sabra. The, uh, oh, those, those guys do magnificent work. They really do, and uh, they, they know so much. They are super serious in what they do, and they're they're very good at it. Right. We're also going to talk about baseball board games. Did you play board games when you were a kid? Also, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Challenge the Yankees fan. 
and oh. uh, the the great part about Challenge the Yankees was uh, they would give you these um, how could I put it blank cards where you know since people were being traded all the time they'd give you like a little caricature uh, 260 270 third baseman hits about 20 home runs and uh, not a great fielder and you'd pencil in somebody's name and then you'd play challenge the Yankees and uh, of course the thing was always uh, since the Yankees had all the home runs in their card they always won so <laughs> I, I never got to Stratomatic I know people uh, seriously you know really made that a a vocation, but uh, yeah, I'm a big challenge to the Yankees fan. Well, to this day, I play simulation uh, games where I make leagues up. I uh, the computer helps me do it, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, I'll take the '58 Braves and the '55 Dodgers and the '54 oh, Giants, '64 wow. uh, Cardinals, 60, that kind of thing. And I'll play like a, a league with all these guys. Like it keeps the statistics. It gives you a little game to play. And uh, it's all an offshoot of games we played as kids. And um, Baseball has that connection. I had a friend in Stanford, Connecticut, who has risen to a, a position of prominence there. And for purposes of what I'm going to say, will remain nameless. But uh, he actually went out for his junior high science project and had built out of scratch materials, paper mache, string, metal, whatever, corrugated steel, a perfect replica of Shea Stadium with working lights. It was absolutely unbelievable. Fake architectural grass, you name it. And oh. he would <clears> – <throat> he was also an organist. And he would simulate games in his basement. He would take me down there. And he would light a cigar. He would put the cigar by the stadium so you had that aura of smoke that you used to have at the ballpark. He would have lineup cards that they would show on Channel 9 that the managers would fill out. He had them perfectly copied to what they were there. He would sign Gil Hodge's name at the bottom, and we would play the simulated game. And then in between, you know, like, like we'd be throwing a piece of paper back and forth, and between innings, you know, he would be Jane Jarvis and play the organ. I mean, this actually went on. Oh, my guy, Lord. What did he go on to do in life? Uh, educator. Uh, educator, a very prominent educator. And I, you know, he was just a, just that big of a Met fan. <laughs> I love that. That is really terrific. You set up your whole basement, you organize it. Um, Next time I'll tell you how I, um, how I met Jane Jarvis and uh, things she told me about uh, what song she was playing when 69, when the, the uh, we'll save that for another show, when the field was getting torn up. and really, It's, it's not really, a kiss and tell thing, is it, with Jane? No, 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 no. It, it, it's really, oh, good, it, good. It, how, how could I put it? it um, Jane Jarvis, uh, I, I met her two or three times and spoke with her. A very serious musician, uh, not a baseball fan. This was something she did. It was really, you know, she was divorced from her husband. It was kind of extra money at night. And then when she'd finished the game, if you could think of this, she'd play. If you went to Shea Stadium, you know, it was a nice little concert, you know, before the uh, police shoot you out. Okay, guys, you got to go. And then she'd go to the Diamond Club and play for two hours. Then take the subway back to Manhattan. Then work her day job. I mean, mean, this was like, you know. (laughs) Wow. And, and she'd take requests in the Diamond Club, you know, Embraceable You, uh, Love Me Forever, whatever people want to hear. Beautiful. Yeah. You know, now, now they're putting organs in some of these stadiums, which is incredible. They, they went through the whole metamorphosis of taking organs out and putting in yeah. music. Some of these stadiums are now uh, people looking back. We're not the only ones that like to look back. Is I guess that's what I'm saying. And yeah. uh, nothing like organ music at a baseball game. Just uh, seventh inning stretch. That was great. Also, Kate Smith with um, thing comes to mind. Seventh inning stretch. Kate Smith was very big into early radio when I was a kid. She was. Oh, a, yeah, I, I'm these, a huge uh, Kate Smith fan. No pun intended. I love Kate. Yeah. Yeah, and she loved you, so that's... Uh, <laughs> she loved everybody. You, know, you you miss her, but she, yeah, there was reason. 
Um, you do love everybody. You're a good guy, Tony. <laughs> and, um, Kate had that whole second and, career because when she started with the Philadelphia Flyers and God Bless America, and they, they would play that when they needed to win a game, and then she started singing it live, and Freddie the Fog Shiro would bring her flowers. <laughs> right. I don't know who uh, came up. I think it was Shiro who came up with that statement. It, it ain't yeah. over till the fat lady, lady sings. I think yeah. that was um, in reference to her. And she ended up on Donnie voice. and Marie. She had a whole second career, you know, all, all because of, you know, Freddie Shiro. Yes, yes. Um, rest in peace, in peace, Freddie Shiro. I miss Well, I, I love the Freddie Shiro story where uh, the Flyers had won a playoff game, and uh, they all went out to celebrate. The next day was practice, and he comes back in the morning, and he was always dressed really well, as you remember from the bench, you know, the red tie and the vest and the, the brightly checkered jacket. And he comes in, he's got cuts on his face, his glasses are broken, his clothes are ripped, and everybody's like, Fred, what happened to you? He says, I really don't know, but some, somebody called me an animal, so I beat the crap out of him. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, this is why this team wins. I mean, they just had this yes. fight that he... Yes. Right. All right, Tony. Okay. Come back. Yeah, sorry I to trust. be so long-winded. We'll talk soon. No, long-winded. We love you on, on these airs. <laughs> and um, I like I say, you're my Thank godfather. <laughs> Thank you. Talk to you soon. We'll talk uh, soon. Bye. We'll see you next segment, guys. Hang in there. I'll be back in a little bit. Be well, Tony. Bye, Bye. now. You too, Zach. Bye.